Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is October 27th, and we will hear Empowering the Next Generation, Young Professionals Taking Action Against Food Insecurity. For content questions related to the presentation, just type those in the Q&A box down at the bottom in your bar, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Uh, I will ask that if your question is for a particular panelist, you state that in your question. That just helps. And if you have any technical issues, again, type them in the Q&A box, and I will do my best to answer those as we go along. Next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2023. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and uh, free to members. And today we are sponsored by um, the Food Systems Division. Is it Food Systems Division? I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Excellent. And you'll hear a little bit more about them in just a moment. But we want to thank you for joining us today and for joining our series this year. Coming up on your screen now is a list of our two remaining sessions for 2023. Um, actually, we do have more in December. We have two more in December. Uh, to note, we have a law session coming up. It's, a, it's good for CM law credits. It's on Friday, November 3rd. Um, and we will have registration up hopefully by the end of today or early Monday morning. Uh, so check our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast to get more information on that. Uh, today's session is worth 1.5 CM credits. To log those credits, head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. If you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook. That's where we post any important date or time changes. I also post when new sessions are available for you to register for. So be sure to uh, like us so that you get updated. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. We record all of our sessions and we post them onto our YouTube channel. So head over there and just type in planning webcast and our channel will pop up along with our well over 450 recordings, all available for free. So if you subscribe, you'll get notified when new sessions recordings are up and available. So again, if you have any questions for our panelists, type them in your Q&A box. Be sure to reference who you would like to answer that question. Um, and with that, I am now going to turn it over to Ariel to kick things off. All right. Hello. I'm going to share my screen. Hello everyone, I'm Ariel and welcome to the Empowering the Next Generation Young Professionals Taking Action Against Food Insecurity webinar, sponsored by the American Planning Association's Food Systems Division. This division was created to help planners build stronger, more just, equitable, and self-reliant local and regional food systems. Our efforts strive to help integrate food systems planning into other areas of planning. Planners play an important role in the development of healthy, sustainable local and regional food systems to support and enhance the overall public, social, and economic health of communities. At its best, Food systems planning is rooted in the collaborative partnership between the food system community, including farmers, retailers, consumers, and the local and regional governments. It's important for planners to think about and identify the various food production opportunities and food security challenges in their community 
to develop public policy tools that better connect underserved residents with those who produce food. Food security is defined as a household level economic and social condition of limited or uncertain access to adequate food. According to the USDA, 12.8%, meaning 17 million US households were food insecure in 2022. Food insecurity is a pressing issue that we all need to talk about because it's relevant to everyone and everyone deserves access to healthy food, period. Um, and as planners, we need to look at the intersections of food systems, whether that's transit and transportation, if you're looking at bus routes or transit stops near food hubs or grocery stores, looking at the efficiency and the reliability the reliability of those systems, um, looking at public health, the health of our communities, um, sustainable communities and community development and everywhere in between, there's so many um, intersections in planning with food. And today I'm very excited to introduce three amazing uh, young professionals working in the food realm um, in Demasia is an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she is a student director at CNU Wisconsin. Corey is a culinary scientist and food studies master's candidate at New York University. And Emma, she is the assistant manager of Montgomery Park's community garden program. Um, the goal of this webcast is to highlight these young professionals working to alleviate food insecurity in their communities and we will discuss their journey to finding their passion in food and how their interest has grown into a profession in food systems. We also will discuss strategies they're using to address food insecurity and how public policy has a significant impact in their work. Um, to learn more about food systems, the food systems division, or if you're interested in further exploring food systems, um, please consider joining our division. We'd love to have you. Our next quarterly membership meeting is January 25th, uh, next year at 6 p.m. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, I think that's it for this presentation part. Um, and we have a few poll questions for you all to help us think about our own connection to our local food systems. Thank you, Christine. Thanks. And as soon as we're done with the poll questions, um, I will put some links in the chat box for you to get more information on the food systems division and information about joining and what they do and what, what they're up to. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and launch our first poll. Uh, we have three questions for you. So uh, the first one is now live. Um, and to my panelists, you don't get to vote. So <laughs> if you're wondering, why can't I vote? You're not allowed. <laughs> I don't know why. The Zoom people decided. I totally if you are on a Zoom. right. <laughs> did you? I know it's funny. Um, if you're on a mobile device and you don't see it, the pop-up. Um, I'm sorry, some some mobile devices have weird settings that don't allow pop-ups. Um I'll give it another moment here. Okay. I I personally I had to think about this one for a minute and I don't really know I don't I don't know the answer. I don't know my own answer. So, it let's see. A few times a week. So, the question is how often do you think about where your food comes from? So, the largest group 38% says a few times a week, then 32% say once a month, uh 18% say once a day. And then 12% say not at all. All right, I am going to go ahead and launch the next question. How far is the closest grocery store to where you live? Give it another moment. Uh, 
Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and end it and share the results. So 54% say less than five minutes, 37% say five to 10, 9%, 10 to 25, 0%, 25 or more. So aren't we all in a good position, the majority of us? All right, I'm going to launch our final question. Does your community have a farmer's market, a community garden, a community supported agriculture, also known as a CSA? And while you're answering this, I'm also going to put another link in the chat box. Um, so a few weeks ago, the um, again, the Food Systems Division um, provided a session on food and freight. And I'm going to put the recording to that in the chat box as well, because that like some of the stuff in there just blew my mind, <laughs> blew my mind, like never thought of it. So I'm going to put a link to that session recording in the chat box as well. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end it. Share the results. This is great to see. 90% say yes, we do. 6% say no. 4% say I don't know. Um, I mean, that's wonderful to see. And I think also part of it is we tend to lean towards knowing those kinds of things just as planners. Um, but that's great. All right. Polls are ended. Um, and you guys can feel free to get started. I'm going to close off um, my video, but I am here in the background. And folks, again, you have questions, type them in the Q&A box. We'll get to them at the end. All right. Thank you, Christine. Okay, ladies. Um, for our first question, can you describe your background and what inspired you to pursue a food uh, career in food and for in food systems? I guess I can get us started. Um, so when I was in undergraduate studies. Um, I studied environmental studies and I took a class that was focused on agriculture and climate change. And I had no experience doing any kind of gardening or agriculture. So it, it felt a little funny to me to be studying that and not know the real application of how people farm. And so I started working on farms part time and got really interested in that and just exploring the connection between people and food and the community around food. Um, so that inspired me to get my master's in sustainable food systems. And I kept working on farms, kept working on that link between community and food. And now I work for Montgomery Park's community garden program, and I get to help kind of facilitate that community and food link throughout the county. Awesome. Yeah, so for me, um... I grew up in, in Maryland, like near between Baltimore and Annapolis and Anne Arundel County, and I've always loved food and kind of been obsessed with it. It's always been a really intimate um, topic for me, like with just the role it's played in my family and everything. And so I always knew I wanted to, uh, I don't know, as a kid, it was be a chef, you know? So then I went to the CIA and realized like that wasn't the only way that I could engage with food, um, just, I, there's a bunch of amazing classes and amazing people I met there that helped open it up for me. But I think Ecology of Food that I took a class um, called Ecology of Food with Dr. Deirdre Murphy. And we engaged with how food was connected to the earth and people. And that rocked my whole world. It was absolutely beautiful. And I think the more that I learn about food and culture and food systems and can like reflect on how my relationship with food growing up impacted um, how I view it now is definitely a huge, um, huge guiding force for, for, how I, um, for how I study food and how I like work towards a more secure food system. Thank you. Yeah, as well. Um, I'm a first generation American. My parents immigrated here from Cameroon, and they both came from agricultural families. And so that part of farming in when my parents ended up moving to suburban northern Wisconsin was trying to sort of keep up that tradition 
and also can like combine the food traditions of where we were. Northern Wisconsin is a big hunting tradition. And so venison, small folk like rabbit was also very common in the area as well as um, living on uh, the intersection of Oneida and Menominee territory, bringing in food traditions of beans and maize, it all got sort of amalgamated together. Um, and it was really interesting to see the foods that my parents grew up eating and grew up growing not be available to them because they didn't grow in subterranean Wisconsin and cold tundra Wisconsin. And so it was always a really exciting time when one of my parents would go back home and then bring seeds with them or bring dried food with them and the excitement to be able to feel in touch with our culture and who we were again. Um, but I, I think the really the biggest thing that pushed me towards food systems was just the experience that so many like young girls have with body insecurity and the demonization of food for women and how food is weaponized against women is sort of a thing that should be shied away from or good foods and evil foods, low fat, low carb, et cetera. And so sort of working towards acceptance with my own body and how that contributed to food and also the larger ecosystem of how many people, this thing you have to do every day, you have to eat every day became almost so fraught and so tense and how that would also layer if you know you didn't have time to cook or you didn't have time to, or the ability to purchase fresh healthy groceries and how we politicized and demonized food in different ways and how that was baked into our built environment. And so that's sort of how I got there. Wow, all of you are just amazing. <laughs> um, so our next question is, what is your food philosophy and you can kind of take that how you want to. Um, and the second part of that is, why is it important to think about where your food comes from? Yeah, I'll start off on this one. I think a big part of my food philosophy, <laughs> which is a funny question, but is like connections and making connections and building them and maintaining them because when we think about food systems, you know, it's a system, it's a web, it's, it's all connected, <laughs> um, which is why it's kind of the core of the philosophy. And whenever we trace back, like whenever we are, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> why is it important to think about where your food comes from? Okay, no, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's where I was heading with that. Like, because I think it's important because whenever whenever there's a problem or an issue and you have to trace it back, it's going to come down to what kind of relationship you have with with whether it's even like the grocery store cuz it's not always farmers like I I'm thinking because I'm in New York City right now and I grew up in like suburban Maryland and so the farmer conversation wasn't um it wasn't a conversation I was having until more recently. Um, and it's really important and I'm sure they'll talk more about it too. But like sometimes it's as simple as like talking to the person who orders the food at the grocery store and saying, like, I want this product because I know that, you know, this brand is is, you know, doing something a little bit better for the world or or even going down to the community garden and being able to make that connection with your neighborhood to say like, well, this food is culturally relevant to me. Like I want to plant these seeds here and having that sense of like sovereignty in the community is, is another big connection. And so like conversations um, to lead to like the increase in the security is a big part of my own uh, food philosophy. Yeah, I think jumping off of that, the idea of food gets really romanticized because it should be. Food can be all these different things to so many different kinds of people. What a cup of coffee means to me to someone else is very different because I've worked as a barista and someone else may not have. But I think it's important to think about where our food comes from because our romantic idea of food can sort of crumble when we realize some of the conditions that these foods 
were grown in, were produced in, were processed in. And like, I think about the phrase, like a seat at the table a lot and what is on the table that's being served. And like, does it matter that everyone has a seat at the table if, you know, this, the conditions of which what's being served were not done fairly? Um, and so in, in sort of trying to continue this like almost spiritual connection to food that I think everyone ought to have, knowing where the food comes from is the first step. I took a class a couple of years ago called Labor in the Global Food System that really highlighted sort of an ethnographic look at people's stories, what sort of large, you know, agro-business looks like, what small agro-business looks like, and how, you know, we can demonize one or praise the other. But throughout all of these, we don't have a holistic framework for what it means to get our food well. We just trust that people with good morals do it. And, you know, a lot of people with good morals are doing a lot of very good stuff in the food system. And it's really exciting, especially as we move forward towards more organics, more, more CSAs. I have the privilege of living in Madison, Wisconsin, which has one of the largest, if not the largest CSA programs in the country and one of the largest open air farmers markets in the country. And so it's really exciting to be in a place of bounty, but understand that it's geographically limited. And if I were to go somewhere else, or if just people were to go somewhere else, or if it doesn't rain enough next year, all of that could come to folly. Yeah, what the other panelists said really resonates with me. Um, it's all connected. And I think it's really important to have that holistic framework about the food system um, to recognize that someone did put in a lot of work and materials and effort to have that strawberry be available in your grocery store or things like that. Um, but I also think it's really important to think about where your food is going to. I think you can't forget about that half of the issue too, because there is so much food waste in this country um, and just a lot of waste in general in the food system. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so what is your area of specialization and what does that look like in terms of the work that you do and its impact on your community? Um, like Ariel said, I work in the community gardens program. So work a lot with community gardeners. Um, and in terms of the work I do, that sometimes means creating new gardens. Um, I also do inspections and make sure that people are actively gardening, help them with gardening resources, planning community events, things like that. Um, and then impact on the community. We have about 500 community gardeners in our program. And a lot of the county is made up of um, people who have immigrated here. I think it's like 30% of the population in the county. So there's a lot of people gardening from other countries that maybe can't find produce they're used to in grocery stores. So it's a great way to kind of expand the foodscape in the county. Um, and we also have gardeners that donate some of their produce. So that's also um, impacting the community by making fresh produce available to people who maybe don't have a plot or who can't afford produce from stores. That's really cool. Um, I would say my specialization, just back on like the philosophy with connections, um, I just kind of made up a word active academia because I've been in school for quite a bit now. And, you know, sometimes academia can feel like a separate sphere, but it's really, really important for me to take what I learn and apply it and not just like go deep, so deep that I'm separating myself. And so, um, you know, I still, I don't have like a big question for my thesis coming up in May, which I should, but because my background, <laughs> I've scratched on, you know, the molecular gastronomy side of things and the farming side of things. And I'm taking a business class right now. And it's just important for me to 
always be connecting the different realms of my life to something active. So like going to my community garden down the street and just seeing what everyone's up to there and saying, oh, you do this project, like I can get my hands in on that. And I know somebody who can help with this. And so again, back to connections and the food industry is so big, it's so diverse. And so, but at the same time, you know, it's a small world after all. So I would guess, yeah, my specialization being active academia and feeling rooted and grounded in different segments of the food industry. Yeah, um, very similar to that. I think the food system is so flexible and it dips its toe in so many other just, I guess, disciplines that it's really hard to find a niche um, I've been thinking about this as we've been talking. I think I would say my area of specialization would be in like community engagement and evaluations almost. Uh, I'm working on a couple projects right now. One is working with the city of Madison to evaluate over the past 10 years. They have a program to where organizations can apply for a food system specific project aimed at reducing food insecurity in a certain area. It's called a seed grant. And we're doing evaluations on the past 10 years of grants um, in which over $275,000 have been given to different organizations, anywhere from $500 to $10,000. And we're, we're finding out that like a lot of, 26% uh, of that money went towards space towards having a facility, towards buying more fridges, towards having more shelving on the walls. And we're both doing like this, like, okay, let's go through the spreadsheet for like two hours and figure out where the numbers go, but also direct interviews with the folks in the food system, the people who wrote the grants, the people who applied the grants, the people who benefited from them and just saying what worked, what didn't, how can we make this better? And sort of being that connector between the people with the resources, the city, who wants to be committed, but doesn't have quite the capacity to. And then the people who have the ideas, have the energy, have the capacity, just don't have the resources to. And so building that bridge of flexibility between them, as well as um, working on another project based on one food pantry in the city of Madison and making a cookbook. Um, so doing interviews with uh, frequent users and trying to figure out like what foods get stocked that are important to you. What would you need to make your favorite family recipe? What is your favorite family recipe? And so we're doing a photo essay series um, to where I am trying my best. I'm doing the photography, I'm writing the interviews, and then we're gonna put together this cookbook and we're working with a farm in the Madison area who's going to cultivate a garden based off of the ingredients necessary for the cookbook. And so that garden will then always staff the pantry so that those folks representative of the, the area that the pantry is serving will always have fresh vegetables that inform their own cultural practices. Thank you all for sharing that. I mean, it's just so good to hear about how diverse food systems is and also um, the in your perspective areas, it's just really amazing. Um, so food systems planning is, rel is a relatively new specialization in the planning field. Um, it includes so much uh, from land use planning to economic development, community development, infrastructure, um, remaking systems to make them more equitable. And um, given that definition, do you consider yourself a food systems planner? Why or why not? I think before this question, I would have said no, but um, there is a lot of overlap between my work and planning, I think. Um, I saw in the chat, someone was wondering where Montgomery County is. I'm talking about Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, and the way our park system is set up, we actually have Montgomery Parks and Montgomery Planning in one organization. So there are a lot of planners that are also involved with deciding where we put new community gardens. Um, so I think in that way, there is a lot of overlap. 
with food systems and planning. Um, and I also went to a talk recently where someone made the case that food system planners are also in public health because you know it impacts what people are eating and all of that. So I think it really just goes back to food systems is a whole system and you really can connect it to almost every part of living because food is so central to living. You know, it's the basis of life in a lot of ways. So yeah. I think I hope to be a food systems planner. I come from a, a, a plucky place, I think. I, I graduate in May with my bachelor's, so I wouldn't consider myself much of anything other than a student right now, but uh, I hope to be a food systems planner. Yeah, I, before given that definition, probably wouldn't have called, and called myself a food systems planner, and, and I don't know if I actually can, but putting in the work to make a more equitable food systems through community development is something that I do feel like I'm doing, like just sh working with neighbors to grow food is is a really important job like that in itself is creating a more secure food system in the community and like how we utilize space and having a say in how we utilize space is really important like it was so crazy about maybe two months ago at our community garden there was this huge intense meeting happening because right next door like there's this empty plot there's uh, I'm in Brooklyn I'm in Flatbush Brooklyn and there's a lot of redevelopment happening around and so there's this empty plot and the people who plan to build the building right there they actually came to the garden and were, they were asking our opinions and like asking about like the height of it because like the sun was growing and they they included us and that was really cool that was amazing I felt I felt I felt like a, a food systems planner there for a bit. Um and you know they're they're gonna they're gonna make their own decisions and do what they do and rent out the space. But the fact that they had the consideration to say, well, maybe we can do a rooftop garden on the building or, you know, what what how can we engage was was really cool that they um considered our opinions. And so maybe I'm on my way. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, going off of your point, Corey, um, can you all give examples of success stories or positive impacts you've witnessed as a result of your work in food security? Just to, I guess, keep going on that. I, you know, it's interesting, like, we, when we talk about food security, <laughs> I'm in this food and culture class right now and like something that can be frustrating to me in academia is we talk about it like it's an over there problem like it's a them problem but I grew up food insecure and like as a student right now I still am like I really struggle like I depend on that garden like me and my roommate we grew kale and collards there just to actually eat and so I think the success story for me is being able to feed myself, <laughs> which is, and like, it's interesting because I've never like grew my own food before. Like I've, that's not, that has like Walmart was where we went, you know? So just this cultivating a more intimate relationship with the food, not just in a theoretical way, but we have a little greenhouse <laughs> right there where we can like grow herbs and like, that's so magical to me. It like actually makes me emotional just to have the knowledge that the skill set to do trial and error with seeds and nourish ourselves with it is it feels success. It feels like success to me. Um, I'm I'm a student on the University of Wisconsin's campus and huge university, 50,000 students. And during the pandemic, we saw a huge jump in food prices all over the country and especially in our area. And also a huge restructuring in just the way that students were receiving funding for their education, particularly graduate students. 
Um, and so I was involved in our student government has uh, two locations of a food pantry. One is in a like graduate student development and one is in a very like undergraduate focused place. And something that we were seeing pretty heavily were a lot of graduate students and particularly international graduate students who were not just coming, you know, like I may have to college at 18 by myself, ready to be independent and forge my own way. We're coming with children, we're coming with their parents, grandparents, multi-generational households in these like graduate student design departments who because of the pandemic, research was halted for a really long time. So like their projects and their tenure in graduate school were being extended without any like adjustments to the grants they received for their research or funding in any single way. So it was just pandemic was a really hard time for our graduate students on campus. And so we were able to bolster our like service to graduate students and really sort of um, push through language barriers as well, because a lot of folks we were dealing with primarily spoke either Mandarin or Cantonese um, and or Tagalog. And so being able to like form a connection specifically between undergraduates and graduate students who do not talk unless one is grading the other's paper, like that was really, really fortunate. But then to once we got our bearings a little bit, turn around and say, this isn't okay. This isn't you know, graduate students need to be able to feed themselves. Uh, you shouldn't just have to starve for three years on the way to a promotion or a raise 10 years down the line. And so working and advocating with our graduate student union, advocating directly to the presidents and the chancellors of our university to fight for, and it's an ongoing fight for a larger graduate student stipend, but every, we got a raise for graduate students coming into this year. And so that was a biggest impact and almost born from the food system, but not just of the food system. Yeah, I think with my program, um, I mentioned that gardeners donate produce and that really started during the pandemic when the gardens were just kind of like a safe space for people to be outside and get outside of their houses and see other people. Um, and as of now, they've donated over 15,000 pounds since 2020. So I think that's been really great um, for the food banks and also for the gardeners to feel like they're engaging with the community in that way. Um, and we've also tried to encourage people to grow a lot of variety of crops. So things that maybe wouldn't typically be donated to food pantries like garlic or bitter melon or things like that that maybe people aren't used to seeing in food pantries. Thank you. Um, just as we talked about successes, um, can y'all touch on some challenges that you've encountered in your efforts um, in your work around food systems and food security? And Emma, if you could touch on um, some of that in your work as at the community garden, I think that would be really interesting. Just yeah, um, some of the challenges we've encountered probably just having land access for gardens or for any kind of food related projects. Um, as a government organization, we definitely do have more land than a lot of other organizations because we have parkland, um, but being near DC and more urban areas, there's still limited space, especially considering the number of people trying to grow. Um, so that's been a big challenge. And then I think also just um, maybe being able to like monitor the gardens and make sure that people are actually growing stuff sometimes can be a challenge. Um, and then something more general that I think is a big challenge is just being able to address food insecurity. Um, I think our donation program is really great, but I also recognize that giving out food at food banks isn't actually the long-term solution. It's kind of just a band-aid for like, here's some food now, not how can we make sure that you are actually food secure. 
um, through work or something like that. So I think that's definitely a big challenge and maybe not something that parks can address as an organization, but I hope we can make some kind of impact. Um, I think there are a couple significant challenges I've seen. The biggest one is just fatigue and exhaustion. Uh, it feels very like Sisyphusian to combat food insecurity because with every, you know, family or person that you help, there's going to be three more people who now know you're a resource and also need that help. Um, and it can be sort of daunting at times to feel like, you know, something as simple as like getting the shelves stocked on time by 4 p.m. when the pantry opens is like, if you don't have the right amount of cereal boxes and you run out, is that a family that doesn't get cereal for a week or something like that? Um, and I think that that really harkens to what Emma was saying with like emergency food aid, food banks, food pantries, community meals, donations, all of this has become a larger norm than usual. And it's turning a lot of folks who like maybe are just like occasional gardeners or volunteers into almost like the bolstering social safety net that we are not getting through other means, which, you know, without sort of like the infrastructure of support becomes really daunting, um, specifically through like nonprofit organizations because they're so siloed. And you can have, like we do in Madison, 30 organizations doing the same work with overlapping reaches that aren't talking to each other and as such are doing repeat work and getting burnt out and exhausted. And so, but even within that, like, I think community work gets praised a lot as it should without the like reality of, of community work being inherently conflictual. Like, there will always be people doing great work that you just do not like. And that becomes like, some people are annoying and that's just the truth. And they'll be doing amazing things, but you just won't want to work with them. And like how we don't learn to navigate conflict with people who are going towards our same goals. And that becomes really, really tricky. And so you almost start doing repeat work out of spite because you just don't want to work with that guy. And so like having the ability to like within advocacy, like foster connections and or like just learn like what a working relationship looks like or even how to pass the baton because if me and the guy I don't like are doing the same thing, is it okay for me to admit that maybe he can do it, I can drop it, and I can go work on a different aspect? And sort of like these, these personal ideas of humility and time and focus, I think become big things. And those are more philosophical things than like, oh, the trucks don't come on time. But those are the significant challenges I've seen. Those are some really good points. You said a lot there. Um, and just to kind of build off of that, like, I would say some challenges that come up a lot is just getting people, like, rallying people and getting people to show up and speak up. Um, with so many changes happening all the time, it can be really overwhelming for general community members to feel like even that they have a, a say or that, like, you know, their voice matters. And so really energizing folks to to take action even small actions um can can be really challenging and then like the people who do decide to you know take the action and show up in spaces like that consistency and like letting people know that it's okay if it's just a little bit of time a week or a month just whenever but but just continuing to instill that energy um and to maintain that energy in ourselves as well, to keep giving back, to put into other people. And like and like Nazima was saying, like whenever things are changing hands, um, so stuff can get lost in translation, but batons and torches have to be passed because it takes all of us. And so, you know, just starting up and initiating and having conversations that catalyst energy just to begin, just to literally just showing up and telling people how okay it is to to not know or feel like you know you have to be in some certain role or have to perform a certain thing just 
being in a space is so revolutionary at times um, and making people feel safe and welcome in those spaces, not in not overly intimidated, like that we all are supposed to be here um, and reassuring that because like, it's just so easy to be intimidated by, I don't know, like a, an expert gardener or somebody in academia or something. It's just like, we're all, you know, we're all just Joe regular schmo and, and it, that's okay because it's important. Oh. Um, thank you all. Um, that kind of goes into my next question. I want to start with Endemasia for this one. Um, can you describe some key strategies and approach, approaches you're using in your work right now um, in, with your work at you know, the food pantry on campus? What are some strategies that have evolved over time? What's working? What hasn't worked? Um, and how are you seeing that impact um, students? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is just using a diversity of tactics and like um, acknowledging that like certain models will work, but they won't evolve within like in and of themselves. Like the like the food pantry model isn't really meant to evolve. It's meant to like you have shelves, people come in, they take their food, they go. This is not like I uh, a, f a phrase I heard one time in organizing work was like, you want to do your job so well, you don't have a job anymore, which is like to be constantly working on improving the conditions surrounding you doing social work to where that no longer needs to exist. And so like, it's been interesting in seeing folks think about a food pantry and their role in it, going from like, okay, I volunteer once a week, I come in, I help people get their bags and groceries, I stock the shelves, whatever, to also being like, what is my role in ensuring that like, we don't need to grow, we actually need to shrink. Like my biggest idea would be that like food pantries, like our food pantry doesn't need to exist because our students are food secure and that's just the end of it. And so like, we don't want to be expanding hours and expanding volunteers because we don't want that need to be there. And so some tactics in sort of this like structural role have been the advocacy with key decision makers, like on campus, that means like chancellors of student affairs, working with financial aid, working with even like admissions with housing and dining and talking to the chancellor at large about like what the scope of this issue looks like but also because we're a public institution confronting what it means for public education to get funded at the local and state level. So we're meeting with our state representatives going to the governor's office. And we even sent a trip to Washington DC last March to go meet with our state representatives about like, what does expanding SNAP for um, college students look like? What does it mean to like continue to have the pandemic era, like public health emergency aid for college students? What does it mean to expand the Pell Grant? So more um, money is going directly into students' pockets and offsetting, you know, the cost of tuition, the cost of living. And then um, in the community food pantry I work with, it's thinking about what other community organizations are we working with? Can we partner and get grants? That's where we got the, um, it's called the Purpose Grown a pantry. So that's where we're working with a farm to purposely grow food just for the pantry. And how are we, you know, confronting from, you know, from the individual to the block to the state and federal levels? What are we doing within our tactics while also running a food pantry, which is very difficult to sort of shrink our program as necessary? In my work, um, I would say one of our key strategies moving forward that we've been trying to implement more and more is using a community equity index to decide where new gardeners are where new gardens are constructed. Um, so really making sure it's areas that maybe don't have as many parks or haven't had the same resources provided in the past. Um, we're also working on installing some food forests, so areas where anyone can just walk in and forage and have a big snack or maybe some berries that they wouldn't be able to purchase otherwise. Um, and then also just interacting with a bunch of different stakeholders, so being a part of the county food council, working with a variety of nonprofits, 
and having gardeners advocate for us within county council and places like that to really get us the support that we need to continue going on. Yeah, I would say um, some strategies of mine have definitely evolved over time because I feel like, well, one, I move around a lot and I do want to feel engaged with um, the communities that I'm in. And so like at first that might have just been like showing up and sharing everything about me and all these ideas that I have to make things great. But man, being being in Brooklyn, being in Flatbush has really changed a lot to for me and just like stepping back and observing. It can be really harmful to just kind of think that the solutions that I have are the best ones. And so um, showing up, like I said before, but then listening and observing. So to watch patterns that happen with the community, to see these need gaps, to see how people engage with one another and just kind of really being a student of life at all times so that so that I can see where I can, you know, have the most uh, engaging or so where my role can be the most strong, you know, where it can be the most impactful instead of just like <laughs> ramming into things, just taking taking some more time to to um, to look and just be for a moment to create the most efficient solutions. Thank you. Um, that's really fantastic. And um, our next question is about public policy. Uh, public policy can significantly, significantly affect food systems. Um, and I wanted to ask you all to discuss the role of advocacy and policy work in your initiatives and um, any changes that you believe are essential for a more sustainable and equitable food system. Um, yeah, I just like what my fellow panelists were saying before about the role of policy to really support instead of this over-reliance on the private sphere, which is just it, like it should not be growing that much. Um, and and staying, staying up and staying educated on it, which is maybe really obvious in things, but there's always changes happening and there's always bills being passed. And so engaging with a multitude of um, outlets just to stay the most informed is maybe yeah maybe obvious but is <laughs> challenging too <laughs> at the same time and so being able to know like what you can or what I can do what we can do and what's actually happening so that money's not being taken away from support systems like SNAP and WIC and so that money isn't being excessively funneled into the silos of of um community support is just like and it happens so fast like it's almost scary so um yeah yeah i can talk about um i a funny story is I, I had an internship this past summer with the National League of Cities. And one of the things I really wanted to focus on was uh, within their federal advocacy department, connecting cities with the federal government to talk about the way that the farm bill has affected their community. As we all know, wh where's the farm bill? Uh, it was supposed to come out in June and it's not here. And the, the disastrous consequences that that piece of legislation not being renewed has to where mid-November we're looking at potentially another government shutdown and SNAP and WIC are the first programs to lose funding. And then uh, Wisconsin's a really unique, <laughs> lightly unique sort of uh, political ecosystem because of the, the requirements, the work requirements that get put on on the state level for SNAP and other public benefits to where like you have to have been looking for a job for an extended period of time, the restrictions for how long you can use these benefit systems and uh, the public health emergency going away in April. As we know, it's not like 
the disease went away, but the, the support for it did. And so now we're seeing people who no longer qualify for SNAP, who no longer qualify for all these different aid programs. And the ways in which I saw emergency food assistance programs, community-wise, nonprofit-wise, and at the university, all brace for this huge uptick in usage. Um, the, the food pantry I work at in my neighborhood is now distributing like two to 3,000 pounds of food a week, where it used to be 500 at the top of the year. That's because the assistance went away. That's because more people need this service. And so that sort of growth and those public policy changes are, they just sort of put everybody at risk. And they're often not informed by the people who need it the most. They're informed by numbers and by lobbyists who, you know, put up forth their own opinions. Yeah, um, I agree with what Corey said about just staying up to date on public policy and educating yourself. I think for farmers or urban growers, there are a lot of brands and opportunities there that just aren't like passed along enough or like no one is really aware of. Um, so utilizing those I think is really important. And I think also just being really involved with your local policies and local government, um, like in Montgomery County, they just released a tax credit for urban farms. So just advocating for things like that or, you know, like a tax credit for gardening in your front yard. Like there should be things like that that really encourage better use of land. Um, so just getting involved and staying involved. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really like that. There should be more incentives for people to, or who want to grow their own food um, to do so. Um, and this again goes into my next question. I wanted to start with Emma for this one. Can you highlight any uh, collaborative efforts or partnerships uh, you formed to tackle food insecurity effectively? I know that the, uh, the community garden has a few partners. Um, so can you uh, talk about that? Yeah, so we have partnerships with end parks that really help us be successful. Um, and then with outside organizations, we partnered with a nonprofit called Harvest Share, and they handle a lot of the logistics of actually picking up produce from the gardens and delivering those to food banks. So they've just created a really great network where anyone can kind of plug in and know which food banks are open which days and when they're doing um, their deliveries and things like that. So it's helped make it a more effective system and just allow more people to be involved because of that. Um, and like I said, being a member of the Food Council is also really helpful because you get to hear about what other organizations are doing. And a lot of times there is overlap, but those conversations aren't happening between organizations. So just trying to be collaborative in that way and really know what else is going on within your food system can be super helpful. I guess I'll, I'll echo what Emma said. I think the, the county food council and then here in Madison, we also have a citywide food council and the way that they work with each other is just really inspiring because it's a volunteer council and most of the folks on there just really care about the food system. And they often work in different parts, either from the planning department, from nonprofits, from local gardens. And so having it almost be like, like a, think think tank or like a meeting ground for all these people who really care in your area as well as being you know volunteer experts who want to come in we get to make policy on food we get to be the ones who you know decide areas of food insecurity we work with the planning department to conduct their studies we approve the maps and we we put in i think over two hundred thousand dollars worth of funding to the city without oversight from the city council, which is crazy every year. Um, and so we get to really make an impact through that. And it's a really successful collaboration. 
And so I, if anything else, I encourage everybody to join their local food council. You'll meet a lot of people who also care. You'll see a lot of different kinds of expertise and advocate for a youth seat on your food policy council. Um, Madison has a youth seat for anyone in the area age 18 to 24, oh, 16 to 24, excuse me, to participate. And they have youth seats on a lot of their different councils. I currently sit in the youth seat and it, from other uh, members of the committee, I've always been told that the youth perspective, often from a high school or college student, really makes an impact for seeing the food system in a different way. Yeah, that that's actually very cool. Um, and I should join my food council here. Um, but when I think about some collaborative efforts, again, I think about the the buildings that are constantly being kind of tore down and restructured and how collaborating with them like there's there's um a church in this community who's like okay well we're going to be on the first floor level and bring in kids to work on the rooftop garden who can also work at the garden next door and so like just bringing in a bunch of different um bodies to to engage with with different aspects so not just the food but like infrastructure as well and then this hasn't actually happened, but I just had this idea of like, because cultural relevance is so important everywhere, but like in Flatbush, it's just a large Caribbean population. And so like the garden grows like Callaloo, which is um, a, a green. And so like having something like that to be sold in the cafes, like there's a cafe called Lips and they do specifically like Caribbean foods, like plantains and sawfish and things and those types of collaborations. Um, they they really matter to to sustaining um important elements of of food insecurity that's not just um the basics but cultural relevance as well okay thank you thank you for that um love Kalalu. it's amazing uh, <laughs> um so i want to touch on how do you all engage with stakeholders with different motive, motives and goals. I know that in Demasia, you touched on having so many different uh, nonprofits doing the same thing, but not really communicating. And I know that Emma, um, working in the community garden program, you also interact with other organizations um, as well. So how do you uh, balance and manage those relationships? Say that some of our most challenging stakeholders are actually within parks, just because there are a lot of different ways that park lane can be used. You can have dog parks or tennis courts or you know this and that. Um, so really, just educating people about the benefits of community gardens um, and getting community support is always a good way to just share how impactful they can be as spaces. Um, and then also just working with stakeholders to find some kind of overlap because there usually is if you just kind of hold that space to have a conversation and really hear each other out, just trying to approach it with the collaborative that I think can be helpful. Um, a, a metaphor I like to use a lot is like, you know, there's the wooden ruler and then there's the flexible ruler and they both measure 12 inches and they both have like the same sort of goal. Um, you wanna be like a flexible ruler because you're able to do so much more, but also like you have your stated goal in mind, but it doesn't mean that that can't change. It doesn't mean that being flexible is going to make you get there or get to your end game any less differently than like a rigid ruler would. And so like, I think when you're dealing with people with different motivations and different goals, you, you should have your own in mind. You should be steadfast in them and you should believe in them and you should be open to anything that can change that goalpost in any way. Because like, I think what Corey was saying really resonated with me to where it can be really harmful to walk into a situation and be like, this is what we're gonna do. I know the right way to do it. I'm informed by this study or this paper and I have this degree, whatever. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it could just not be that community's goal. It could 
be more harmful to do the thing that you have posited is the best thing to do. And so as long as you have a goal, be flexible about it, be open to it, be open to also, if you want to go 12 inches and someone wants to go six, you don't have to disagree because you both want to go six, you know, so work with people to get to their motive and then keep going, use their capacity to bolster your own. Um, That's, that's a lesson I've learned. Yeah. It, that's so well said literally yes exactly like just honing in on the core of something because you know there's always a bottom line and like making sure that that's clear and well stated and understood and and by understood I don't just mean like oh you get like you see it but understood like as in felt and engaging w- with that feeling of the core goal to then branch from there because there's no need to create excessive limits. And I think, you know, stakeholders can can be so many different people. Obviously, you know, it could be <laughs> people who have very different ideas of what the end might look like. And so kind of doing some, if not erasure, just stepping back so that expectations and managing expectations, oh my God, managing expectations is like, really important so that no one is leaving like super disappointed or having the wrong idea but this understanding of what's working towards and you know like Emma was saying that there's benefits for everyone and there can be a varying amount of what those benefits look like but just knowing that like we're all gonna grow whenever we engage together and so that's motivating in itself um, for everybody. Yeah, it's not a one size fits all solution. <laughs> Every community has their own needs and their own goals and um, learning how to manage the stakeholder relationship, manage relationships between um, different organizations that you're working with um, is part of the process and it is really important. And so I'm glad you all are um, a part of that positive change. We're getting to our our closing questions here. Um, So given the current statistics of the, from the USDA, about uh, 10%, 10.2% of the US households were food insecure in 2022. What do you think is the biggest challenge in achieving universal food security and how can this be addressed? Do you think it's a structural thing? Do you think it's a economic, thing, um, policy, or a mix of all the above? I I don't want to like belittle the issue because of how big and important it is, but, (laughs) you know, yes, policy and greed and, and, and people really just choosing to stop funding war and to fund peace and to fund food security like it's it's such a frustrating thing because you know it's laid out in a in an agenda and they get to that part and they're just like nope we're not going to put that money there and that, there's a lot more to it and I hope the other panelists will maybe speak more to it as well but like there's just choices and us in advocacy we have to like just keep pulling on on not just hard strings, but facts and data and, and yeah. Yeah, I think building off of that, it's, it's a policy thing, it's a structural thing, it's an economic thing. I think overarching from all that, it's a culture thing. It's really disheartening that like a dominant doctrine was that like, if you, can't afford to feed your family it's because you made a mistake or if you can't x it's because of you like you just try harder you just work harder just work more and like every pantry every program is going to have the story of the person who works three jobs and still can't manage it the person who is on 80 hour weeks and still can't manage it and because of this like demonization food insecurity is so hidden because it feels shameful to admit it it feels like you've done something wrong. And I think 
there have been some strides, particularly as we navigate like the world after COVID is like, we're seeing doctors, nurses, teachers, people in some of these professions to where we view them as, you know, this is the ideal, this is how you should be. Also being like, it's hard to pay my bills. It's hard to find time to cook. And like with it, there's this, this back and forth game of like what food is good and what food is bad. And you see that with what gets subsidized through SNAP and WIC and what doesn't. And like, you know, it's, there's a currency of time with food. It is so lovely to be able to cook a meal for myself at the end of the day. But that's if I have the energy and the time after work and classes to somehow, every time you make dinner, it takes two and a half hours for some reason. And so it's like, how do you find the energy to do all of that? And how do we think about that currency of time? And how do we build an environment that thinks about that more succinctly? I don't know. I, this is, a non sequitur. Everybody go read the book Feminist City by Leslie Kern. It's very interesting. It talks about the ways in which like urban settings and rural and suburban settings are built in a way that like doesn't encourage uh, care economies, doesn't encourage families and how we subsidize care work through our built environment. Very interesting. It's got me thinking about a lot of this. I was just reading it before this. Um, I think I answered the question. Uh, so I'll stop talking. Yeah, I, mean, I think this is just such a big question because it's such a big issue. I do think it's a structural and systemic issue. Um, you know, our food system in the U.S. was built on enslaved free labor, and those inequities are still present in the food system. And so it's not just going to be, oh, let's change this one policy and we're going to see a difference. It's going to take a lot of work in a lot of sectors um, through a lot of collaboration and just mind shifts. So I think anything that people can do to help make difference will help, um, but it's, it's going to be a hard issue to fix and like a long-term solution, but I think we can do it. Yes. I just Go ahead. I just want to circle back just because of you know, what you guys are saying is also just really inspiring. I think it's so important not to, like, make, like a lot of us feel like it's our own fault, you know, and not to embody those really toxic thoughts and, like, that there's, like, you know, there's systemic powers at play that can e so easily seep into our minds that to make us feel um, like we can't talk about these things and that, you know, it can be uncomfortable and challenging. And so, like, Yes, it is systemic and yes, there's policy works, but I guess for for us as like citizens and community members on the ground, just knowing that like we're working our asses off, like we're working really hard. We're like, and it's 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 a privilege and a luxury to have this excessive time to eat such to to make big meals that nourish it. Like it it's something that like, I, you know, we should be approaching with gratitude at all times and also recognizing that there's powers and forces at play that are actively working against us all the time too. And so, yeah, I just wanted to circle back to that. Yeah. Um, I think the pandemic, we're still feeling a lot of the impacts of that still in that really, um, exacerbated so many inequities and inequalities across the board from food inequality to housing um and even i think last year or must have been earlier this year the white house had a meeting on hunger so thank you all for being a part and doing the work and addressing it and um advocating for food security and it's a really important issue that still needs to be talked about. Um, and as young professionals, what advice would you give uh, others interested in pursuing a career in food systems or food broadly um, and how can they make a difference in the field and what has your experience um, been like?
I would say, you know, here in New York City, something that's just been so surprising to me is the amount of community gardens everywhere. Like, yes, it is a concrete jungle. And at the same time, there's so many people working to make spaces available and just actually engaging with those spaces. Like, sometimes the gates are closed all the time, but those gates are closed because there's not the volunteers there to keep the gates open so that the hours are, you know, so like it takes us to show up. And so I, I just think like just ground level, like I said before, um, finding, finding the space to, and also like, I guess, figuring out in a clear way, like what impact you want to make, like what, what impact you want to make that maybe you feel like is, affecting you most intimately and then how to just reflect that back you know to switch that back like okay this is something that I struggle with and so finding the reason for that getting specific about it because there's a place like there's a space and really realizing it first of all like acknowledging that there's a place and space finding it and then engaging with it um, which takes time and it takes research and being willing and carving out the time research because like our whole lives are also happening at the same time and so you have to choose you have to like actively choose like I put on my calendar you know this time every week I'm gonna go and I don't always go sometimes but like whatever I can like you have to, it's it's a really active choice and so yeah um I hesitate Again, because I haven't graduated yet to call myself a professional in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I would say don't reinvent the wheel. Um, if there's something, if you're seeing a need that needs to be addressed, like I I say this from a, a like a, a nonprofit hub of the Midwest, like there might be someone already doing it or trying. And the biggest thing to do is just start talking to people about what resources already exist and how to either like extend them over the problem that you're seeing or how to like, it's easier to be a connector than to, you know, start something all over. And so maybe it's just like the city and a nonprofit need to have like one 30 minute conversation and they'll go, oh, I didn't notice this gap and boom, it's fixed. And so like, try to like marshal your own connections, your own networks, and just like view the issue through the lens of like the overarching system, because that's where you can see some of these connections for more broadly, instead of focusing on like the very specific thing in and of itself, because solutions will probably be found easier. Um, and then read a lot, like read as much as you can, but also question everything that you read and question what you see as expertise and question why like when something's written down versus someone says it on a webinar versus someone says it in your neighborhood, one is seen as expertise and one isn't. And so just like talk as much as possible and uh, go for a lot of walks. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Talk to a lot of people um, try to connect the dots between organizations and yeah, just explore and see what's going on because I promise you someone else is having that idea too. And if we can just join up and work together, then there's a lot of opportunities to make a difference. That's all amazing. Um, getting to the last two questions here. I just want to make sure that we have, we have enough time. Um, how do you see food systems evolving in the coming years? And what role do you envision young professionals playing in this transformation? I'm definitely optimistic about it all. Like, it, it feels like it's going in the right direction. And I don't know if it's it's just you know, me and my circles or what, but just, or, you know, the feedback loop on the social medias, but I feel like the food system is evolving to create more connections. If nothing else, like during, you know, the peak of COVID crisis, like noticing supply chain gaps and just 
the embarrassing disconnect <laughs> like and then now this push for transparency and efficiency like that in itself is about to go all the way off you know like it's going off at this moment as in going in the right direction um and I feel like for young professionals being what's that word like um natives of the internet like just the way that we think about connections is so different it's so like a given it's so inherent and even though I do think like it's so much easier for some people to kind of like speak up and take up space in virtual spaces whereas maybe for one generation like it was just a virtual space I do think like um getting out of the excessive isolation into this IRL is it's happening like I, I I feel it happening like the mistakes that were made um are kind of being acknowledged and adjusted um on a on a youth level you know like I, where I just feel like the youth is so much smarter <laughs> they just so have so much more access to information it's just like that the, the even I'm thinking about my nieces and nephews and my nibblings who they're looking at us like you guys haven't figured this out yet. It's so simple. And so like that gives me a lot of hope for sure for those transformations to happen. And so I, I see I see a, a bright connected future for food systems happening fast. Okay. Emma, I'm sorry. Did you already speak? I just want to make sure I didn't skip you. Oh, um, I guess I would say I see the food system just evolving to be a more diverse, creative, and innovative space. I feel like there's been a lot of increased interest in the food system recently and just new ideas and energy in the space, which is really cool to see happening. Um, like when I graduated from my master's program and would tell people that I studied sustainable food systems. A lot of people were like, oh, what is that? Like, I didn't know that was a thing. Are you going to be able to find a job? Um, and now it's really cool to see those opportunities just continuing to grow. And I think it's only going to continue with climate change and the need to find better solutions. So I'm just really excited to see how the field grows. Thank you. And for our last question, um, what insights or lessons have you gained about the importance of understanding local food systems and their impact on community, social, and economic vitality? Um, uh Again, being based in Wisconsin, it's cold and dark and snowy five, six months out of the year. And there's a joke that there's not much else to do in the winter but eat and drink. And so food is like a very important part of the Midwest. And we, we love to go out to eat. We love restaurants. We love cooking for each other. We love big meals. And like it's it's inseparable from not just social vitality, economic vitality, just the general sense of like living. Um, and I think it's very much informed by the fact that I like grew up here and I still live here is that like the food system, and I know we haven't touched on it a lot, but thinking about restaurants and bars and kitchens in general mm -hmm. and that part of the food system and like the grocery store, my mom would always joke was like, she would go to home work, school, and the grocery store when there is uh, um, snow on the ground. Those were the only four places she would go during those four months. And so, you know, it's, food is important. Food is, a, a, you will die if you don't have it. And you will die if you don't use it to connect between the people you know, the people you love, the people you are yet to meet. So, yeah. I'll um, add to that just the 
the role of cafes and bars and restaurants in a local economic vitality like I love it makes me so happy whenever I see a new spot open up that I can support like just a new coffee shop that I can go to instead of the Dunkin like because it just makes me upset when I see all of the same things and just things looking the same just everywhere like city blue city cities (laughs) that are just copied and pasted and it's like that diversity is so important and so like in order for that diversity to be maintained like giving our dollars and so that economic vitality giving our dollars to the special places and kind of you know taking taking the risk it might not be as consistent as mcdonald's because that system is not in place but that's what makes it special and i think um this newness of the of the food studies industry um shines more light on why it's so important to engage with like local local cafes and local restaurants and and why it's important to give them give them space to grow and make mistakes and it and it can be a lot of fun because they're also invested in the community and invested on a bunch of different levels like you know maybe they live there as well and they grew up there and they will listen they'll actually listen and that means so much to a community and it's also a space for gathering like again like Flatbush is magical and they're really holding on to something tight as gentrification seeps down into Brooklyn and and you can see it you know you see it as you walk down the street and it's it's just really beautiful to see um just the local the lo- the locality of the life teeming definitely a buzz yeah yeah i definitely agree with what what the other panelists said and i just i think the biggest lesson is just how important food is and really recognizing that because it can be something that oh you're just like oh i'm hungry let me just grab this little snack but really bring that intentionality every day to thinking about your food and all of the people and things involved with that is just wild when you start thinking about it. So I encourage everyone to just to engage with their food more. Well, that's all I have, folks. Uh, panelists, thank you so much for um, taking the time to join us today and to talk about your passions. And um, I hope the planners and planning adjacent professionals gleaned um, some jewels today and are able to incorporate a food systems perspective in the planning process or any processes in the future. Um, So thank you all so much. Um, Thank you. We didn't get to any um, of our attendee questions. So if you have a burning question for one of our panelists, feel free to email me and then I can get that question and your contact info to our panelists to answer it directly. Um, And you can email me at info at ohioplanning.org. Don't forget to log those CM credits if you need them. Head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast for all that information and to register for our upcoming sessions. So thanks again to the Food Systems Division for sponsoring today's session. This was a wonderful conversation. And thanks to all of you for being candid and true on the line. We we appreciate you. And um, everyone, thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. And we'll talk next time. Thanks, everybody.